from Boss Track, It's Her Hype Squad, a show about amazing women who've made incredible strides as leaders in their industry. They're here to support you and your leadership growth, to encourage you and hype you up as part of your Hype Squad. Hello everyone, it's Michelle Harris, here to bring you an all new episode of Her Hype Squad with Boss Track. Today, we're getting awkward with Henna Pryor. We talk about her book, Good Awkward, what it is, and embracing awkwardness in leadership, using improv exercises with your team to build trust and encourage open communication, the power of telling ourselves redemption stories in place of contamination stories, and so much more. You'll really enjoy the awkward moment in the middle of the podcast where we try to figure out where the bubbles on the screen are coming from. You really never know when you'll experience those quirks and unexpected moments. But before we get into the conversation, I'll share Henna's bio to set the stage for our talk. Henna Pryor, PCC, is a highly sought after workplace performance expert and an award-winning two times TEDx and global keynote speaker, author, and executive coach. Her clients call her their secret weapon for impossible change, an honor she wears proudly. She's known for her science-backed approach to improving the performance, habits, and actions of hungry high achievers in her fun, no-nonsense, no-jargon way to move them from their first level of success to their next one. Henna founded Priority Group, a fast-growing performance growth firm, to expand on her belief that the key to most people's success is leaning into awkwardness a little bit longer to skyrocket strategic risk-taking and be braver in the work that we do. She's recognized as a success magazine woman of influence, and her best-selling book, Good Awkward, was endorsed by NFL quarterback Russell Wilson and former HBR editor Karen Dillon, and was named a Kirkus Review's Best Book of 2023. If you enjoy my conversation with Henna, be sure to subscribe to our channel and help more people find us by sharing this episode with others or by leaving a review or subscribe to our weekly newsletter filled with things we found that we're excited about and inspired by, along with valuable leadership advice to watch, listen to, or read. It's a little bit of joy for your inbox each Monday. You can subscribe at www.thebosstrack.com forward slash weekly joy. Okay, so now let's get into my conversation with Henna Pryor. Hi, Henna. So nice to have you here today on Her Hype Squad with Boss Track, where I'm so excited to dig into this conversation. It's definitely something that I got excited about as soon as I saw saw your book. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank, thank you for having me. For, for those that are listening and can't see, I'm just really thrilled that my hot pink shirt matches Michelle's hot pink glasses right now. So we are we are off to a great start. I love it. We are. And we've got some blues coordinating as well. So we're, yeah, (laughs) we are ready to go. Yeah. Love it. Well, we we did provide a formal bio uh, of you before our conversation, but I'd love for you to share a little bit about you and your own words. So before we get started and and dig in. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Henna Pryor. I am a workplace performance expert, keynote speaker by day. That's how I spend most of my days. I also do a little bit of um, small group masterminding specifically for women leaders and executive coaching. And uh, the last few years, I'm really proud to say that a lot of my emphasis has been about, about emerging women leaders. So I was one of the early founding guides with an organization called Chief that is a network for executive and women in leadership. And also I'm involved with my alma mater, University of Delaware's Women's Leadership Initiative uh, and some other partnerships as well. So this particular group of ambitious change makers has my heart in a way that I don't think many others do. So I'm just really excited to be part of this. Great. I love it. I love it. And um, that just reminded me you're from the Philadelphia area. That's where I went. I went to school up there myself. So I, I, yes. I miss that area a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Born and raised in Delaware. I now live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, and uh, I have to do a little go birds because we are in football season, but uh, yeah, it's, I love where I live. It's beautiful around here. Yeah. Well, let's dig in. And uh, you have a book called Good Awkward. And I'd love to really start out by because I think this is going to shape a lot of our conversation. Uh, maybe you could tell us about what inspired you to write write that book. Like, wh- where were you at in in your own career that you said I, this is this is what I want to write about and focus on? 
Yeah. You know, I, I always jokingly say, I don't think, you know, seventh grade Hannah thought she'd write a book on awkwardness one day, but in many ways it surprises no one but me. Everyone who's known me is like, yep, this makes sense because my story from childhood, really all the way through to college was one of feeling awkward often. So my parents are immigrants to the United States. I'm first born American. And so my clothing was never quite the same as my friends. My food never smelled quite the same, you know, and I constantly had this feeling of the me that I wanted other people to see always felt like it was clashing with the me that was on display. And not a day went by where I didn't feel impossibly awkward about that. And so I grew up, I went to college and in college, I think like many do, I started to find a little bit of my own, who am I, you know, who are the other people that are sort of like me, but really the interest in this topic for the book and what actually ended up being the first TEDx was, you know, when we got into the professional spheres and I started to take an interest in professional development, I remember that our queen Brene Brown, who I know many of us are fans of, Mm -hmm. she would end her podcasts or her interviews with a very specific tagline, she would say, friends, stay awkward, brave, and kind. That became her tagline. And I would hear that and I would think, stay brave. Yes, I know how important that is. Stay kind, agree. My parents taught me that one. Stay awkward? I don't think so. Lady, I've been trying to get rid of this my whole life. Like, what are (laughs) you talking about? So I got very curious about that specific word and that specific emotion as it related to the workplace, because all I ever knew was bad, awkward. All I ever knew was an emotion that held me back and it made me feel really yucky and gross. And it became just an interest for me. How is this something that we want to stay? How is this a good thing? And thus began the deep dive. I love it. I love it. And we will share your TED Talks in the show notes for anybody looking to, uh, to, 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 to check those out. Um, and I love that you shared the uh, the photos of <laughs> you when you were younger. Is that something yeah. that you knew you were going to include or is that something that was kind of an ev- evolution? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's experience is shaped by their conditioning, right? So, so w- one of the main through lines of the book is, you know, in order to manage this emotion is we have to unpack our relationship with this feeling and where does it come from? And it doesn't come from nowhere. In fact, no one you know, say for very few that are maybe extra astute, but for the most part, children do not feel awkward. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a self-conscious emotion that develops around age eight or nine, according to social psychologists, most children, not all, but most children younger than eight or nine don't experience the emotion of awkwardness. They don't care who's looking, you know, yeah. you, you may have a, a child or a niece or a nephew or a neighbor who is just swinging their hips in the kitchen and singing at the top of their lungs. And they don't care who's watching or if they're any good at it. This self-consciousness, this what do other people see is something that we develop as we move into adolescence, as we move into middle school, high school, into our professional lives. And so I think understanding kind of the kid version of our story is a helpful starting place. Yeah. I don't know if you've got the feedback, but it's so interesting to me because I'm kind of older and in a later phase in my life. And, Mm -hmm. and when I talk to a lot of women now, they're like, they're back to that point of not caring and just living their life the way they want. So it's interesting that whole evolution of we start out that way, we care a lot and we spend our whole lives caring. And then suddenly we get to the point where (laughs) so many things I think so many things like that fall on a, you know, kind of that bell curve, you know, when, when yeah. it comes to, you know, the way we are as babies versus the way we are as elderly, right? There's so many comparisons yeah. and that 100%, Michelle, you're spot on. That is one of them where we don't care when we're younger. And then for many, we shake off that need for approval when we're older, but it's an interesting kind of yeah. top of the bell that's in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'd like to back up and talk about let's define what good awkward, well, what awkward being awkward is mm-hmm. and what good awkward is. And then yeah. maybe how we can relate that, like uh, our audience is primarily women in leadership roles, maybe, you know, new in their leadership role mm-hmm. and, you know, how, to, how, how does this apply to them and how can they think about it? Yeah. Okay. So for the purpose of this discussion, awkward and awkwardness is the emotion that we feel when the person we believe ourselves to be 
think of it as our true self is momentarily facing a gap between that and the person on display. In other words, the person we are, our internal identity is different than who they see our mm -hmm. external reality. So when there's a gap between those two identities, we tend to ex experience the emotion of awkwardness. So just a few other kind of defining characteristics. It is a social emotion, meaning we don't typically feel it when we're by ourselves. So if I'm just sitting here in my office doing some work independently, reading something on a paper and I mispronounce someone's name horrifically, if no one was here to hear me, I don't typically feel awkward about that. Mm -hmm. But if I do the same thing in front of peers, in front of coworkers, leaders, colleagues, the feeling would be very different. Also, I love that you use the term, you know, being awkward, because also an interesting truth to anchor into is there's no such thing as a factually awkward person. No such thing. Awkwardness is subjective. It's an emotion. So we can experience it one of two ways. We can experience it as a state. It's an emotion. I feel awkward right now, but many people do refer to themselves as awkward as a trait as an, I am awkward. I am socially awkward. I am just an awkward human being. And that's fine. As long as it's serving you to say that, because again, mm -hmm. awkwardness is subjective. It's not a fact. It is up to you to call yourself that, or is up to someone else. But if it's holding you back, then we need to be careful about using that identity language. If you're using it in a self-deprecating fun way, but you're still taking chances, no problem. But it's really important that we anchor into that fact that it is a social discomfort. It is an emotion and it is not a statement of fact. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that you, you clarified that because I, I can imagine if I say, well, there's times that I felt really awkward. And I think you give these examples in your book. Like when you, somebody says, I don't know, have a, have a, have a safe flight or enjoy your flight. And you're like, yeah. you too. You too. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, darn it. That was, yeah. but you yeah. feel like it's a feeling of just being awkward yeah. because you said the wrong thing and, uh, or the, you know, the wrong thing at the wrong time. <laughs> right. Right. And those moments, you know, they happen to everyone all the time. And it's, it's in that moment, if we're really going to dissect it in that moment is the person I believe myself, someone is someone who listens or I'm paying attention to when others speak. When I say you too, I sound like someone who is not really paying attention. I sound like I'm an idiot, right? There becomes this you know, dissonance between these two people. Um, you had asked sort of what, what's the difference between, you know, what makes something good awkward? Well, bad awkward is typically defined by the emotion occurring, which it's going to, because to avoid awkwardness means avoiding any uncertainty or being able to predict in a crystal ball how everyone else in the world is going to behave. Right. But bad awkward occurs when we try something, we say something, we have those interactions and that awkward feeling consumes us to the point, it grips us to the point that we are less likely to do that thing next time, or we yeah. avoid said situations the next time. It, it puts a paralysis over us. We freeze versus good awkward is when we take those moments in stride, we learn not only to deal with them, but actually lean into them, embrace them quicken our comeback rate and recognize that building that musculature, that social comeback rate is going to actually help you take risks, innovate, go for your dreams and do all the things that you want to do. So actually leaning into it and embracing the power of it unlocks a whole slew of benefits. Yeah. And I, I do want to dig into that a little bit, but first, like how does, and maybe it doesn't, and maybe it's just a different level, but how does being awkward or having yeah, just, I guess the term awkward, mm -hmm. how does that differ from just being uncomfortable? Sure. So awkwardness is an emotion of discomfort. So this is a little bit of a rectangle and square situation, okay. right? Okay. Uh, uncomfortable can come from a lot of different places, right? We can feel discomfort through a variety of emotions. We can have fear, we can have anxiety, we can have awkwardness, we can have um, nerves, right? There's a lot of different ways discomfort can manifest. Awkwardness is specific to A, it being a social situation. We can feel uncomfortable at home by ourselves in many different ways. Um, B, awkwardness exists in this very specific sphere of us doing a very often subconscious, but sometimes conscious mental scan for approval. Mm -hmm. As a social emotion, we're kind of doing lightning fast calculations of 
what do other people think or what do other people see right now? So it's very specific to that context versus more generalized discomfort, which can come from a variety of areas. Oh, I see. I just, um, sorry, distracted. You had something pop up on your screen. Is that oh. come up? <laughs> Did I? I don't there was know. like a little bubble, a like bubble, which is completely fine. I was just weird. No, this that. actually, no, this happened the other day. This must be some new zoom thing or some new camera thing. I think last time when I, like I did this and something, okay, I have to figure out how to get rid of it. I don't know what it is. It just started like yesterday. I have no oh idea, gosh, Michelle. Yeah. No idea. I have, to, I have to look that up. That's so funny. It's fun. I, I like it. I mean, but I don't you know. Can have... I don't know why, like, no. what did I do? And how, uh, I have no idea. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll have to kind of go back and analyze it. Weird, <laughs> weird. No, I, I'm going to figure that out. I'm going to make myself a note so I can get rid of it because I don't know how it's going to go. Oh, oh well, so sorry. So <laughs> didn't fine, mean to sidetrack us fine. there for a second. So for people to kind of relate to this idea of being of, of awkward and what good awkward is, do you have a story that you could share for, from maybe your own story or from, you know, people that you've talked to since writing the book about somebody kind of feeling awkward and embracing awkward um, yeah. to lead to their professional growth and kind of relating it to, you know, our audience, which would be, you know, women that are maybe newer in their careers. Yeah. I have a great story I'd love to share. And I'm purposely going to share one that unfortunately I wanted it in the book, but we had to, you know, do some cutting room floor. Not everything yeah. could go in. But one of my favorite stories is uh, I have a good girlfriend, Melissa Jordan. She's fantastic. She uh, has been in marketing for many, many years. And she recently was telling me how she had applied to a job at another organization at the time was not selected. But then a few months later, they came back to her and said, Hey, we still have your information and we'd like you to apply to this bigger job, this mm -hmm. VP of marketing. And I remember she was like, and I'm like, I don't feel qualified for this job. This is a much bigger role, much bigger capacity than anything I've ever, ever taken on before. But she had just read something the day before from me on social media. This was right before the book came out about embracing the awkward and letting it be, you know, kind of your superpower. And she said, you know, I'm feeling all kinds of self-doubt around this thing. But at this point, they're asking me to come in and asking me to do this thing. And I don't feel like I check all the boxes on qualifications, but what do I have to lose? So she went in for the interview and here's what she did. And I just love this. She, you know, not only kind of had, had the materials they requested, but she brought in her most insanely awkward childhood photo in which she had this, like just this turtleneck. It's the best picture. It's like a turtleneck, <laughs> this mullet haircut. Her teeth are just a mess, you know, like something that most people, and she's this beautiful sheet girl, you know, woman now. She brought this in and, and put it up on the screen during her presentation part of the interview. And what she said was, I'm showing you this because by showing you this, what I'm trying to explain to you is that there is nothing that is going to hold me back from trying stuff in this role, right? If I can show you this and stand to tell the tale, my, the worst, most awkward photo of me you don't ever have to worry that I'm not going to take big swings in this organization. They loved it. Long story short, yeah. she got the job, right? Oh, so this, I love this, it. Thing, this thing that, you know, was a source of embarrassment for her. She was able to take and say, you know what? You can make fun of me. This could be embarrassing or I can use it. I could use it to my advantage. And I just think that's such a great example of taking something that could have been cringy for so many others and making it useful in the conversation. Yeah, I love it. And I think maybe being in the marketing background, that yeah. helps too. To, <laughs> sure. very, it's such a creative idea. That's a creative idea. Yeah. I think everybody kind of needs to find their their thing. But I like yeah. I like I love that. Yeah. May I may I share one more quick one oh, just to yes, get like of another course. only because I think it helps to have some other versions. You know, there there's another um group I work with, and the leader of that group said something in a meeting that didn't land. Like it just didn't land right now. This was, I'll admit this was a male leader, but I think this would work yeah, equally as well with a female leader, but it, it you know, the, the group in the meeting kind of was like all looking at each other going like, uh, uh, you know, awkward, the tension is, is in the air. And what that leader said in the moments that followed, I'll never forget it. That leader said, well, that just went over like a fart in church. Oh, <laughs> everyone you know, is immediately cracking up laughing. By the way, this was at IBM. This is like a polished, you know, organization. This wasn't some small startup-y, this was at IBM. 
everyone is laughing, everyone's shoulders relaxed. So this leader, what they did was they demonstrated, yeah, that it was awkward that what he said didn't land, but he was able to take it with some lightness. He was able to diffuse the tension in the room. And what happened as a result, so I was, I, I learned this from somebody who reported to him. He said, what happened, Hannah, in the rest of that meeting is everyone's guard was down. We relaxed. He created this sense of psychological safety of, you know what? We can also say the wrong thing that didn't quite land and it'll be okay, right? We're not going to be yeah. scolded for it. We're, we're going to be okay t- trying things, even if it doesn't work. And so it's such a beautiful example of turning something that could have been this like, ugh, moment into a moment of levity, into a moment of safety creation. So there's so many ways to use these moments to actually create positive outcomes. Yeah, I love that. That kind of blends into the whole idea of being authentic. And yeah. we talk a lot about, you know, being authentic as a leader. And I um, can see where this embracing your awkward, like really ties into the authenticity because people feel mm-hmm. that they are getting the real, the real you and provides that level of trust. I agree with you 100%. I think the word authenticity is prevalent right now. And I mm-hmm. believe 100% in my bones that it is key to our success, key to our long-term performance. But what I often hear, especially from women leaders is awesome. Permission to be more authentic at work. Why do I not know how to do that? Yeah. Right. Like you're telling me I can be more authentic at work and yet why can't I just all of a sudden snap my fingers and be more authentic at work? And so what I think of as the relationship is the emotion of awkwardness is often one of the obstacles we need to overcome or become friends with more more accurately in order to access our true authenticity because we can't be authentic if we can't tolerate awkwardness. Like the the, the two exist hand in hand. So I like to think of it as one of the filters or frictions that we need to address in order to access our authentic leadership. Yeah, so true. And can you share, uh, obviously not giving away everything, I mean, there's so much in your book, but (laughs) what are some ways that people can embrace their awkwardness, like get themselves to a state where they're more comfortable with, with themselves? No, great question. I, uh, you know, I, I can give lots of tactical examples, but largely I'll say from a zoom out perspective, it's really a two pronged approach. Prong number one is create some very specific space for self-awareness around this emotion in particular. So where does that awkward feeling come from? What are the Mm -hmm. stories that you've been conditioned to believe about other people's approval and how they are looking at you and how much emphasis they have on your actions, on your missteps? So, you know, rewinding a little bit, are you someone who grew up in a household where you are not encouraged to step out and speak out because other people were looking, right? So um, I grew up in a South Asian household. There was an expression in South Asian families like meaning what will other people think? That was literally an expression I grew up hearing, like don't do that because what will other people think? And so that was messaging I received very often growing up that I had to examine and re kind of evaluate. Is it still serving me in this moment in time? Often we also don't slow down after an awkward moment to do a little retroactive, right? Why do I feel so awkward about this? What was I expecting to happen? Awkwardness exists in uncertainty and it also exists when, whether we mean to or not, we have certain expectations Hmm. of how an interaction was going to go. So I'm walking down the street, I'm on the sidewalk, I trip over my own two feet while a million people look on. Mentally, whether I realize it or not, I had an expectation that I was going to make it to the end of that street without that happening, but that expectation went sideways. So just a little bit of intentional time spending around either ahead of those moments with our previous conditioning or following those moments. What did that experience represent? What story am I telling myself about that experience? Mm -hmm. And then the second part of this, the second prong, which I think is really, to me, feels most important in the moment and time that we live in is conditioning and specifically conditioning our social muscles because today Michelle you know the year 2023 going into 2024 we don't need to talk to people that mm, much that's true. the world the world has optimized against it i can order my dinner on doordash i can send somebody a slack i don't have to talk to people anymore 
And when everything is asynchronous like this, and we're not, you know, having these rubbing elbows moments naturally where we have opportunities to practice social interaction, we do lose musculature. Research yeah. says that when we don't practice with each other on a daily basis and just regular little conversation, then it actually makes other conversations more awkward feeling, much more clunky, much more uncomfortable. And we know this. We all know this because after the pandemic, this is not just for introverts, by the way, you know, I wrote a book on awkwardness and I'm not an introvert. I'm an extrovert. But after the pandemic, we can all remember that first moment where we went into a large gathering and we were like, um, what are we shaking hands? Are we hugging? Like, what, uh, do you want me to stand over here? We got out of practice at understanding other people's cues and facial expressions and comfort levels. And it took us a while to figure that out. Research supports that we need to keep these muscles practiced. And the, the more we don't interact with one another in live context, the harder it gets to endure awkwardness when it occurs. So practice conditioning is another huge element of this. Yeah. And I, I can, I, I can contest to that. I mean, even after it doesn't matter, like 25 plus years in corporate and interacting with people and talking. And I mean, I'm just a big proponent of networking and getting out there yeah. and talking. And if, if it's a few days or, you know, a week before I go out to another event and talk to somebody, I feel like, oh, I don't, don't remember what to say. <laughs> like right. it just, you yeah. know, until you get back into it, it just feels a little awkward to start having those conversations. So it's, it's so true. And yeah, the pandemic made it all, all the worse. Right. <laughs> and then the, I think the pandemic kicked it off, but then just yeah. the way, you know, technology and everything yeah. has, has evolved. It, it keeps that unfortunate, that, that social weakening going. And you know, what, what we can do sometimes it doesn't even have to be at work. Like Practice in the small moments. I'm, I, I would just make a little challenge to the listeners. Next time you go to the supermarket or to the grocery store, just try this one time when you're in line to not take out your phone. Mm. Just see if you can catch eyes with someone. Next time you're in an elevator, don't hammer the closed door button shut. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> things, things like that where we can create little micro moments to remind ourselves that there's value in social interaction where what happens as a result is not known, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're in the coffee shop, just leave your headphones out. Just give it, give an opportunity to see what a unpredictable social interaction might look or feel like. And I promise you, you're building the necessary muscle to tolerate social discomfort like awkwardness when you actually need to, but without it, it's going to feel that much harder. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So then, so that's like step one and step two, do you say, you know, do you say hello or do you not even yeah. have to go there? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, listen, not everyone's going to be a home run, right? And this is also contextual, right? If you live in New York city, maybe if you smile at someone, they're going to be like creepy, right? Or if you're like, <laughs> right. But, but what do you have to lose? Right. What right. do you have to lose? And this, this is a little bit of, you know, exposure therapy, right? If you can put your phone away in the grocery store line and just smile at the person who catches your eye checking out in front of you. Maybe that's all you do that day, but maybe the next time you try to say hello, maybe next time you make a comment about something they're buying or something, you know, we've gotten away from this human to human stuff, but this is where we get the repetitions required to tolerate. Oh, didn't expect that. Right. Otherwise these things feel like a much heavier lift. Yeah. And I think that leads into de um, deliberate discomfort. Mm -hmm. Are there any other, like, you know, do you suggest like challenges that people can do to start feeling discomfort? And and yeah, besides getting, and maybe that's why we want to experience that is to get used to and comfortable to mm -hmm. this to, with the awkwardness. But are there any any things that you would suggest to kind of exercise that muscle? Yeah. So, so just to, to maybe define this idea of deliberate discomfort is really speaking to this, which is seeking out opportunities to do things that, you know, are not, you know, right, right there in your comfort zone, but understanding that what you're doing is slowly building blocks yeah. of strength for when you need them. So from a professional context, we can do similar things. I often suggest to leaders, Hey, if you're, you know, an emerging leader or current leader, even if you have a small team, big team, doesn't matter. At the beginning of a meeting, try to set aside five minutes 
to do a couple of exercises that are specific to this sort of social mental muscle building. So some of my favorite examples, you can go around and ask your team to share a cracked egg story. A cracked egg story is essentially what's something that happened in the last two weeks that was a spectacular failure or made you feel embarrassed or was awkward. It just was like not, not what you wanted, right? Didn't yeah. quite go as planned. Uh, another example is a bad idea brainstorm where the leader specifically and deliberately says, hey, for the next five minutes, let's just brainstorm some ideas together, whatever their, their project du jour is. But here's the one rule, unrealistic ideas only, hmm. right? Not realistic ideas, unrealistic ideas only. And people say, well, why, why would we do that? Well, twofold. If you're only inviting realistic ideas from your team, because they underestimate their ability to do anything else, then that's where all your competition lives, first of all. Yeah. And second of all, even if none of these ideas are viable, which often people are actually surprised to be like, you know what, actually, that's not so crazy. But even if none of them are viable, what actually happens is research tells us that when we create space for these sort of unrealistic volleys, that the ideas and the conversation that follow are actually more innovative and generative mm -hmm. and creative because people feel like they can let that guard down a bit. Yeah. They've front loaded the discomfort. And so anything that follows is going to have more value add as a result. So leaders mm -hmm. can create space for these types of conversations. It doesn't have to be an hour, five minutes at, the, at your next team meeting and just see the energy change, see the impact that that creates. Mm. Yeah, and we've been talking a lot recently about creativity at mm. work and and how uh, opening up that space and and for innovation and like that that I think that lends really well to that and I wanted to ask you so the cracked egg and I actually never heard that term I, mm. I I'm gonna retain that and, <laughs> and use it uh, but the cracked egg stories how and this is not in those terms but I've had this conversation with somebody recently about talking about those moments of um you know, something didn't go exactly the way you expected. Sometimes you can say, you know, how you perceived it as a, a failure, like a big, big or small failure. But we were, when we were talking, you know, we we're talking about, well, what, what about the people that don't feel comfortable speaking yeah. up and how, how do you, how do you suggest approaching your whole team and those exercises to involve those people that don't feel comfortable? If yes, I'm glad sense. you, yes, I'm, I, it does make sense. And I'm glad you brought this point up because I think this is not something we can gloss over because, you know, I'm often asked, yeah, it, it sounds great to be able to express or, our awkwardness at work or to embrace our awkward mm -hmm. moments. But what about women? What about women of color? And here's the truth. Women and especially women of color are still disproportionately scrutinized and expected to be confident in a form that often translates to flawlessness. Mm -hmm. That is facts. And we cannot gloss over that. That is systemic, right? And this is, you know, just a, a function of we are still new to leadership in now decades of that sphere being owned by white cisgendered heterosexual men. Right. Mm -hmm. This is just this is just facts. This is not an opinion. This is, right. you know, the, the systems that we live in. And so my answer is slowly dipping a toe in the water for psychological mm -hmm. safety. Right. I am not suggesting that you spill your guts on something gone completely wrong without knowing it's OK to do so. You know, looking to what are the leaders willing to model? And if you are the leader, then this is your permission slip. Oh, forget about permission slip. This is your plea to please model this, share your cracked egg stories first so that other people know that they can share theirs. But we got to dip a toe in the water, you know, start small, don't share a huge thing. But also I think I want to, I want to call out secondarily that often we confuse awkwardness with ineptitude. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to confuse those two things because I say in the book, you know, I wouldn't hire an inept anesthesiologist, yeah. but I'd be perfectly fine hiring an awkward one. Right. right. So this is, these aren't the same thing. So if you are generally someone who is perceived as smart, competent, capable, prepared, if you generally show up as someone like that consistently and have an awkward moment that you share, generally speaking, research says that that will not harm your standing. And in fact, it'll actually make you come across as 
more human, mm-hmm. more likable. It knocks you off the pedestal of polished perfection. Gosh, they never get it wrong, right? Actually has upside. That said, that it does not mean you have a permission slip to just be messy all the time, right? We still yeah. have to be, because of that level of disproportionate scrutiny that women are under and women of color, especially, we still have to index on being prepared, being competent, being good at our jobs. Uh, but the occasional blunder is not going to ruin us the way that we think it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate you providing that that perspective. And it's, I mean, you're so spot on with, with all that. So in that situation, and, and I imagine that to even be able to approach a topic, a conversation like that, the cracked egg exercise, I don't want to keep going <laughs> on about this, but you have to already have a level of trust built with your team for them to feel it's okay to open up. So, you know, that's number one as a background, but then second, you share your story. What if, is there any way you can encourage others to, to open up besides just Mm -hmm. sharing your story or have you seen that happen in exercise where something worked? Yeah. Often, often. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the answer is twofold. One is creating space for it. Mm-hmm. Don't expect that people are going to just offer it randomly in the middle. Some, some might, but it's creating space for it intentionally. This is what we're doing, mm-hmm. right? And when you do something like a cracked egg story or a bad idea brainstorm, it's not some people are sharing them. It's you're challenging each participant of right. that meeting to do it. And so when it's everyone's task, then people generally feel more like, okay, I'm not going to put myself out there for you know public you know, attack if I'm the only one sharing it, if th- these right. work best when we carve out intentional space and everyone is tasked with bringing one of these to the table. Sometimes these are best even prepared for in advance, right? You know, the beginning of this next meeting, FYI, tomorrow, we're going to do this. So people have time to think about it because the last thing you want is somebody admits something. And then the next person is like, well, oh, I don't know. I can't really think of anything. Yeah. Everyone's got something. So sometimes it helps to give them the preparedness, but what you're essentially doing is every time you do this, slowly planting seeds for an environment of that psychological safety that everyone wants so badly, but expects to just drop out of the sky. It needs to be designed and we can be in charge of being the leaders that help design that, whether you're in top level leadership or you're a brand new leader with one or two people, anybody can do this. And it's Mm -hmm. just going to be those little, little moments that you create on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so well said. And I don't know if this is, it kind of relates and it might be a similar answer, but going back to when you said about your, your parents and what will people think that is, that is a big uh, concern of people or, you know, fearing failure and what are people going to think or like outside of the exercise we were talking about, are there things that people can do to get move past or get comfortable with failure? Sure. Absolutely. I think, you know, there's, there's a few things that come to mind. Just number one is, you know, Tom Gilovich from Cornell, he refers to the spotlight effect often, where just, Mm -hmm. just FYI, people aren't looking at you as closely as you think, right? That's this idea that people are paying much closer attention to us than they actually are. Sometimes they are looking at us, but often it's to a much lesser degree and they're already over it more than we think. So just that reminder The other thing is there's something called the illusion of transparency. So in an awkward moment, it is easy to believe that people can see all those things that we're feeling and thinking, right? So some of us do turn bright red. I'm not saying this is an exclusive thing, but some of us just, you know, our our hands are a little sweaty, our stomach's a little knotty, or we're feeling a little, oh, most of the time people can't see that. The illusion of transparency is, oh my gosh, they must see right through me. They must see how ridiculous I feel right now. More often than not, they don't. So just again, just anchor into these ideas first. The second thing is there's, uh, I love the, the research from Dan McAdams from Northwestern University. He refers to two types of stories we tell ourselves: contamination stories and redemption stories. So contamination story means after an experience occurs, We tell ourselves a story about how awful that thing was. I just, you know, I mispronounced someone's name in the meeting or I messed up that presentation and a contamination story is, oh my God, I'm clearly not ready to do this. I'm I'm not going to raise my hand to present the next time. It's contaminated the future experience versus a redemptive story is 
you know, my language around this is looking for the gifts in the garbage, man, that presentation sucked. It did not feel that good. However, you know what, Hannah, you raised your hand for it. You don't normally, and you got through it, even though it didn't feel that good. That's just one, one rep in the direction of getting better the next time. And hopefully the next time it'll go better. You learn from it. It'll be easier. Can we tell ourselves a redemptive story? Our brains are wired to survive, not thrive. Our brains have a negativity bias. So we need to understand that our brains will naturally want to default to a contamination story, but we have opportunities to get intentional and override that story, but we have to create the space to do it. What is the redemption story in this? And can we take two minutes to find it so that it keeps us moving forward instead of sliding backwards? Yeah. And I, I love that exercise. And I, I picked that up in the book too. It's just, how can you turn those moments into a, p- a positive situation yeah. and, and, and the learning? Ex- and oftentimes it can be a learning experience or it can just be, you know, well, like what you said, well, I was brave enough to go into that and I, I took a chance yeah. and looking at it for, and through that lens. And yeah. So I, I do want to be, I want to be, careful with time or do you have a hard stop at 12? Uh, do I hang on? Let me check. <laughs> I don't remember. Hang on. No, I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. 12, I, I probably, mean, I, probably by, should... by like 12, 15, I probably yeah, do yeah, need yeah. to jump, but no, I'm good for now. We should still, we should still be fine. I should okay. be to keep you on schedule, but I just want okay. to make sure before we get too far. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when we talk, so one of the things that we talk a lot about is team building and collaboration. And is there a way to use this idea of awkwardness and embracing awkwardness in building a team? You know, we talked about it from leadership to employee and, but is there, you know, a, a way that we can look at that with, with team building? Absolutely. Yeah. There's actually a very strong, again, it's a social emotion. So there's a strong through line with team building. So um, one good piece of data to know is that when teams do something together that they are not guaranteed to be good at, that they are likely to feel awkward about. So I'll give you one example of this Uh, with, with teams, with leaders, I will sometimes do a workshop where we do poetry. I will say, okay, you know, we, we do this fun thing where we have to like assign topics and there's write five lines of poetry. And most people are like, oh God, right? Because most people in business are not poets. It is rare that I do this in, in a room. They're like, oh, I love writing poetry. Like most people don't. And so they're all like, oh, ew, you know, cringe face. They do it. And then everyone shares it. And they are laughing and loving life by the end. It is a huge mm-hmm. confidence builder, but the data tells us that when people do things you know, that they're feeling a bit awkward about, that they're not guaranteed to be good at together as a team, it actually skyrockets relationship satisfaction Mm -hmm. and trust amongst team members. Doing something that no one really feels naturally good at together is a huge relationship booster. The other thing is that one of the best ways you can embrace awkwardness and condition these muscles as a team is through improv exercises. So improv is an accelerator for embracing our awkwardness because improv is built on this principle that you don't know what the other person is going to say next, but you're going to lean in anyway, right? It is based on that principle entirely, you know, yes. And I, I I have no idea where you're going to take this, but I'm going to tolerate that awkwardness of this went sideways, but I'm going to stay in it. And I'm going to keep going anyway. Improv is designed to do this. And so a lot of companies, corporations, teams of all sizes have taken to including improv exercises as part of their team development to strengthen these muscles around enduring awkwardness, about not caring so much about what others see or think, and about adaptability, agility, all these byproducts that come from embracing this emotion um, and so this is, you know, I lead, I lead teams through these improv exercises all the time. And similarly, a lot of people have not done improv exercises as a team. So it's got the benefits of all that stuff that I just said, and the doing something new together, <laughs> which mm. improves the satisfaction. So tons, tons of upside. Yeah. Do you have any, um, so for people that are not l- uh, lucky enough to be in teams where they do embrace improv and have improv exercises, yeah. is there any way that women, or, or not women, uh, people uh, can get involved in improv with, without having that opportunity? Like, um, yeah. I imagine like the group, there are groups that you could join. Sure. Or- oh gosh. Yeah. All around the country. There's, there's troops you can join. And again, if you don't, 
have the time or, or investment to be able to do something like that in the book, actually in chapter eight, there's a bunch of exercise, specific exercises. I think I include at least three or four. Um, you don't have to go to a class. You can just bring, you know, bring that page to the office and say, Hey, can we try one of these? Right. Yeah. There's, there's simple ways to practice. And at a very minimum, the easiest thing you can do is just start incorporating yes. And language into your day to day. So improv is based on the principle of yes. And Instead of saying no, instead of, hey, this isn't going to work for me, it's, okay, I didn't expect you to say this, but let's go with yes. And here's what I'm going to add to that. Or, and here's something, you know, I, I would twist in addition to it. It's just about staying in the moment versus, you know, let's just go back to the previous example. That went over like a fart in church. <laughs> it did. And here's where I think this actually could be valuable, right? Like, is there something we can take where we can continue to move the ball forward instead of letting it stop us in our tracks and the whole thing shuts down? That, mm -hmm. that skill is immeasurably helpful in the workplace because certainty is not guaranteed. It hasn't ever been and it never will be. Yeah, I love it. I love it. As there, are there like, since you've been on, like you've written the book and the book is out and you've been on your tours and talking about the book, mm -hmm. Is there a time just where you still have felt <laughs> awkward in a situation that you might be able to share with the audience? Oh, always. Oh my God, always. I, okay, so I'll, I'll make this very real. Two days ago, I gave a keynote for, um, for Santa Fe, a large pharmaceutical company, and it was 500 people. And the man introduced me, he was super friendly. I said, oh, did you get my intro script? He said, yeah, I read it, but you know what? I'm not going to use that. I, I did a bunch of research on you, da, da, da. I'm just going to do my own thing. So I didn't know what he was going to say about me going up uh, right before he introduced me. Gave me a great introduction, but then he said, and you know, now I want to introduce you to Henna Priority. My name is Henna Pryor. My mm -hmm. company is Priority Group. Priority, yeah. So literally right as I'm about to walk on the stage, he said my name wrong, which was kind of like, ah, oh, do I say something? Do I correct him? Right? It was... Could have been, but I jumped up on the stage. I smiled and I said, you know, Lane, thank you so much. And by the way, it's prior, right? And I, I felt, I felt a way about it. I felt awkward about it because I didn't know if he was okay being corrected and I didn't yeah. really want, want to correct him, but I did it playfully. I leaned in and, you know, kind of use it as a message. I said, you know, pretty, pretty funny, wrote a book on awkwardness and here we go. My name's actually prior, right? Like <laughs> it just, it was a moment where I could use the feeling and make it part of it versus trying to, oh gosh, now what do I say? What do I do? The audience didn't feel uncomfortable about it. I didn't feel uncomfortable about it. You know, it, well, I did, but I didn't let them see that because I yeah. leaned in instead. So I think, you know, I don't think I will ever stop feeling awkward about things. And that is not the goal. You know, I, I really, I, I need to emphasize this. Yeah. The goal is not to eliminate awkwardness. That is a fool's errand. We are humans wired for social belonging. The goal is to improve our comeback rate. The goal is to be able to have one of those moments, lean in and move through it lightning fast, but eliminating it, that's a, that's a race no one's going to win. So I think another strategy will serve us all better. And, you know, I, I always like to use this term, like that cool as a cucumber confidence, I will never know it. <laughs> I snort when I laugh. I bump into things constantly. My husband is like, why do you have another bruise on your leg? I'm like, oh, cause I ran into the desk that's been in the same spot for 20 years again. Like I just, <laughs> cool is not coming for me. But when I kind of realize that the people I admire most aren't polished and cool, they just have a fast comeback rate. I'm like, mm. you know what? A awkward confidence. I can do that. That feels better. I can do that. And so this work is really designed for people who feel like that too, right? If cool yeah. feels out of reach, screw it. Don't be a cool leader, right? Awkward confidence is the new cool. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, so I, you know, personally, I, I want to thank you for bringing this all to light because I, I myself have always <laughs> <laughs> been very similar, very awkward. Yeah. And um, even when I'm talking socially, I'll like dive right in. And, you know, sometimes I, of course, can say the wrong things or things don't come out exactly the way I want. I mean, even when I'm talking on these podcasts, you know, yeah. things can sound a little awkward. And I, and I've, you know, of course, over time embraced it, but nobody really gave a voice to it 
And I mean, probably people have, but I haven't like until I, I saw you speak about it. And, yeah. uh, you know, now you're, you have the book and you're talking about it. Like it's, uh, it's nice to have somebody actually putting a voice out there for it. I, I appreciate that. I, I get that feedback a lot, which is, did you write this book for me? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. well, you know, we authors tend to write the book they themselves most needed. Mm -hmm. So the truth is I wrote it for me, but I realize there's a lot of people like me, right? So yes, yeah. I wrote it for you. Yes, I yeah. wrote it for you. And I wrote it for all of us who feel like we shouldn't feel like this. But guess what? We all do. So, so come on board, right? Like we are all in this together. We are all going to hold hands and trip over our own two feet and say people's names wrong and have typos on our presentations. Like welcome aboard <laughs> to reality. Let's have some fun with it and let's learn how to stay in it because it's not going away. Yeah. And so just to kind of close out the conversation, what is maybe the most important takeaway you would want women leaders to, to have on embracing awkwardness and all of, all of what we shared or what you've shared in the book? Sure. Um, two things. A, awkwardness is everyone's experience. If you, you're going to feel it. And when you feel it, I guarantee at least once or twice, or maybe more than that, you're going to feel like it's just you. No one else feels as ridiculous or as uncomfortable or as embarrassed about this as I do. Confident people don't feel like this. I assure you, yes, they do. Mm -hmm. So awkwardness is everyone's emotion. And the second thing is social tolerance, discomfort of this particular kind. Awkward tolerance is trainable. Social muscles are a muscle like physical muscle, like mental muscle that require attention. So the good news is this isn't like she's born with it, Maybelline thing. This is a, we can do things to improve the way we feel in these moments. And it's up to you. It's in your power to do so. So walk into the world knowing that you can make adjustments in your life that will slowly build the necessary muscle to succeed no matter how you feel you're naturally wired. Awkward tolerance is built, not born. So yeah. you too, you too can do it. Yeah, great. Perfect. Love it. And so moving over to a couple of like the, our standard questions we yeah. ask all of our guests. One of the things that we highlight, of course, with Boss Track is mentorship. And that's really the, the whole point of Her Hype Squad with Boss Track is to provide that mentorship from afar. Do you have a mentor that you can attribute your career success or your path um, to? I have many, but if I had to pick just one, uh, for 14 years, I worked in staffing and I was honored to see that someone who was once my kind of indirect director actually was promoted to COO. Her name is Kai Mitchell. She was the only female in the C-suite at this organization. And she was invaluable to me because, you know, in my 14 year staffing career, I got married and I had two children. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my career was I had babies, I had toddlers, you know, staffing, I was hundred percent commissions. And so I was desperately looking around going, how does a working mother do this? Yeah. Right. How do I? And she was one of the first ones who looked at me and said, your way, you do it your way. You don't have to follow the blueprint the way you did it. I was working from home a few days a week, well before, you know, now the entire world does, but before COVID, I was one of the few in the organization that they trusted to come into the office only a couple of times a week. You know, she was one of the first one to sh ones to show me that there were different ways to be successful. And so I think that really opened my aperture to what are the qualities or environments of a successful person. And so I give a lot of gratitude to Kai for really paving the way for doing things in a way that felt authentic to me. Yeah. And, and that really informs a lot of who I am today. Yeah. So yeah, it sounds like such a transitional time for mm -hmm. somebody to come into your to your life yeah. and be able to help you through <laughs> again. Yeah. So that's a lot. It's, um, I feel yeah. so far removed uh, from that. And how, how old are your kids? They're 13 and 11 now. So, 11. you know, it's, okay. it's been a journey and a half, but yeah. still, you still never forget those people that gave you permission to do it your way yeah. early on. Yeah, definitely. Oh, amazing. And Another thing we appreciate and, and really focus on is, is well-being. So, you know, when it, you can't lead well, if you're not taking care of yourself first, mm -hmm. is there a, um, a routine or a ritual that you do daily in the morning or the evening that you attribute your mental well-being to? Yeah, this is going to sound a bit bougie, but my, <laughs> well, my daily well-being routine is my skincare routine. 
I I think it, it really picked up during the pandemic. And I'll be honest, it, it started because I was incredibly acne prone as a kid. I had to, I, I was not one of those lucky people who got to just like have clear skin. Oh God, no. I had like the worst skin, the worst acne. And so I've always had to do that. But now that I've grown out of that a little bit, what I find is those moments for me in the morning and in the evening. So I do it first thing and I do it at the end of the day. They're my forced slowdown. They're my forced kind of meditation where just rubbing the cleanser or the moisturizer or whatever into my face. I, I make a point of not having it be this quick thing, like the way I do when I brush my teeth. I, I make a point to really just, you know, rub my forehead, rub my cheeks, but it feels nice. So they're just these little moments that I force myself to breathe and slow down. Um, I think everyone has their own thing, but my skincare routine is mine. It's my, it's my, yeah. the day has started and the day has ended thing. I love it. It's like your little mini meditation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. it, it punct, punct, punctuates my day on either side. So it yeah. feels really nice to look forward to it in both places. Very nice. And is there a song, like, do you have a go-to song when you need <laughs> a little confidence boost or energy boost uh, in the day, during the day? Yeah, I have, again, a lot. I have a lot. I love One Direction. It's like my little, oh. I, say, I say guilty pleasure, but I don't feel guilty. I love it. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm unabashed. Um, and this is how we do it by Montel Jordan. I don't know oh. why that song just gives me like the the wings I need on the days that I'm extra tired. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, this is how we do it. We do it however we want. And that that one gets me, gets me going. Got it. Yeah. Love it. Love it. And is there something that you've bought in the last year or so around a hundred, under a hundred dollars that has improved your life in some, or made a difference in your life some way? Yeah. I was thinking about this because I am kind of like a gadget junkie and I was like, okay, well, I, will I think of a gadget? Actually, it's not a gadget necessarily. Uh, as a speaker, I travel often. And so there's a lot of accoutrements I have for traveling, but I will tell you, I recently bought at the recommendation of a friend, a Base, so it's B E I S is the brand. Mm. A mini weekender, which is just it's a bag oh, yeah. that has yeah. it has the you know the the pull pa- the what do you call it a pull through for the luggage handle right mm-hmm. so you can go on top of your luggage. But let me tell you, I've always used a backpack because I just think it's easier to hold than a, a shoulder bag. This bag is just perfectly designed, like the the shoe thing at the bottom, the amount of pockets with the zippers with the. I'm very happy. And it is $98. It is reasonable price, really well made. Um, I really did not need another bag. Let me tell you what I have. I have a lot of bags, but this bag is a 10 out of 10. So if you are, you know, in the market for just a a weekender bag or something that goes as a carry on over your luggage, big fan, super fan. Mm. That's good. That's good to know. I think I've seen uh, the advertisements for that mm-hmm. bag come across. And it's always nice because they show like all the like putting yeah. it in and where things go. And so that's that's good to have heard somebody had a had a good experience yeah. with it. I, I, they're they're pretty bags too. Well, you know who recommended it was a, fr- a friend who's a flight attendant. So ah. that's how that's how I knew. I'm like, well, they know. <laughs> they're <laughs> right. they're probably pretty particular about functionality. It's beautiful and it's really well designed. So yeah, yeah. super fan. Sponsor me, base. I'll take more. <laughs> <laughs> um, is and um, I mean, obviously your book, but is there a book that you've oh. read in the last year, uh, or not even in the last year, that you would highly recommend the audience check out? Mm, uh, I read a lot. So this is hard to pick favorites, but I'll just say recently ish, I, I finished magic words by Jonah Berger. And I, I'm a word nerd. I love the the power of word choice and language, whether we are speaking it to others or the self-talk we use with ourselves. And I thought that book was really interesting. It gave me a couple of nuggets about how our choice of language can help shape our mindset. So that that's one I would recommend. I haven't heard of that book. I'll definitely yeah. check that out. It just Thank came you. out a couple couple months ago. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, Hannah, you are officially uh, part of our <laughs> audience's hype squad. So um, with that, is are there any last words of advice, inspiration that you'd like to leave the audience with before we end the conversation? Oh, okay. Two things. Number m- Number one is my second TEDx. One of the things you'll hear at the end, your your audience will love because I also like the term hype squad. So yeah. watch them both, but definitely watch the second one. And the second thing I would leave them with is one of my favorite mantras is do it awkward, but do it anyway. Yeah. Don't wait yes. until you're ready. Do it awkward, but do it anyway. Yeah, I love it. Great, great words to end by. 
Well, thank you, Hannah, for joining us. If our, our audience wants to find you, where what is the best way to find you? Can they reach out to you? Where's the best way to reach out to yeah. you? Yeah, I'm um, Hannah Pryor in all the places. I would say LinkedIn and Instagram are my preferred playgrounds. So I think I'm the only Hannah Pryor on LinkedIn and at Hannah Pryor on Instagram. Please link up. Uh, you know, it's not awkward. I want to be your friend. I'd, I'd love to hear from you. And, you know, if you do buy the book and something resonates, tell me. I would love to hear it. You know, part of your challenge is, we're trying to improve our social musculature. So if you feel awkward about reaching out, I'm going to encourage you to do it anyway, but please uh, link up. Love to make new friends. Yeah. And I just a shout out. I, I love the book and um, I, do, I do encourage everybody to read it. So thank you. Thank you so much for spending time with us this morning and really appreciate the time that you've given. And I look forward to staying in touch and um, you know, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Michelle. It was a blast. Hi everyone, this is Michelle again. If you enjoyed this conversation, hit subscribe so you don't miss out on our weekly episodes. And if you're really feeling it, please leave a review. We'd love to have your support. You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter where we share things we're excited about, things we found funny or inspiring, and must-read leadership videos and articles we came across that week. You can subscribe by going to www.thebosstrack.com forward slash weekly joy. That's www.thebosstrack.com forward slash weekly joy. Drop in your email and you'll get the very next one. Thanks for listening.